to stand up and give standing ovations because it, was it you who told me that is a way to just get people up and moving. So I'm not asking for a standing ovation. I have some things that I'm going to ask you um, a little bit of interactivity. So when I'm if your response is yes, I do this, stand up. Okay, so it's just a just a way to, way to get people moving and maybe we can start making a culture change of, of helping people to get active where, wherever we can. Um, so, um, the objectives of my talk today are to increase your familiarity with these ubiquitous uh, uh, wearable tracking activity devices, uh, stimulate your interest in using devices that, that are actually out there already in the market for personally improving your own health, in clinical care, uh, employee health. I think um, you know we already know a case that we're being asked to uh, uh, document our activity and get a rebate on our health uh, premium. Uh, population health management and clinical research. So I'll, I'll touch on, on some of uh, these activities and then um, hope to stimulate your thinking about other uh, ways that these devices can be used. Um, as far as how, how I'm going to do the talk, I'm first going to start by disclosing a number of personal interests that I have in the topic. I want to be completely transparent in all ways about uh, what I'm doing and why. Um, and then we're going to review the development of these devices and their features. I'm going to try to highlight what I think are the really important features and limitations. Um, and talk about ways that these devices are currently and could be used in the future in obesity, in other uh, areas of research. So now we start with the, with the interactive part. Um, if you use your smartphone or an app on your smartphone to track any kind of personal activity, can you stand up? Just let me know. Okay, that's uh, pretty much, so about, about half. Um, thank you, you can sit down. And do you do electronic tracking of anything health-related? Meaning? Weight, meaning blood pressure, anything like that. Um, and what about family members? Any of your family members do that? Okay. Um, you can sit down. And um, do you focus on physical activity or obesity or nutrition from professionally from a community or population health perspective. So in other words, not treating individual patients, but are you trying to address obesity in the community setting? Thank you. Um, and have you ever had yourself or a household member um, struggle with weight management? Um, <laughs> The two people sitting well, down, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so now I'm going to go through some disclosures. Um, I have a very slight uh, budding commercial interest in this topic in that I started thinking about these devices and was talking to people at the Cleveland Clinic about it, and they put a piece of paper in front of me and said, sign this, and it was an invention disclosure. And they said, what you just are talking about is an invention. And I realized that I worked for a different institution, so I disclosed it to Case, and three weeks later, Case filed a provisional patent on it. So um, I, my, my invention uses one of the devices that I'm going to talk about today, um, but I don't have a commercial interest in that. So again, I just want to be um, completely transparent about that. Um, and so what my invention is related to using data that come from these devices in a more individualized way than I think is currently being the case. And I have a funding application pending right now. Um, my second disclosure is that um, uh, I do a lot of talking with, you know, with, with clinicians and clinical researchers, and I feel it necessary to give the bias that I'm more of a population health researcher. And I think for most of the people in this room are focused on population health. But it's, it's really important to think about the differences in those perspectives um, as we think about how these devices can be used. If you are a clinical researcher or a clinician, 
you want to know what is the evidence base that these devices work. Have they been tested against a gold standard in a laboratory? Are they safe? Do they do what they're supposed to do? And if you're a clinician, can you get reimbursed for incorporating this device into your practice? For population health, you really you know, need to undergo sort of a paradigm shift in how you think about it. And, and especially if you're an entrepreneur, and you know, an entrepreneur frankly doesn't care if it is validated in the laboratory. They just want to know, does it improve health? Can people afford it? Will they buy it? Um, and, and will they use it? So just sort of keep those uh, perspectives in mind. Um, another uh, disclosure is that I only have a slight chip on my shoulder um, about the fact that I trace my own lifelong struggles with weight um, to my birth at the Cleveland Clinic, which uh, was on 93rd Street right here, um, where my mother was told not only to feed me uh, Similac powder, but also oh, Halo yeah. water. Wow. 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 So, <clears throat> we wonder. Right, we wonder. So, there we go. Is that to get the baby to Yes. Yeah, what was that? Uh, we're not talking about that. Oh, uh, okay. And then my uh, my next disclosure is that I have a, a, you know lifetime struggles with weight management, and um, in the in the turn of the millennium, uh, I had a five year period where I had had my third child, could not lose the weight, and really, really, really tried. And I was fit. I was running five and 10K races. Um, and uh, that's what I look like, and, you know, running five and 10K races. And no matter what I did, I could not lose the weight. Um, but I started wearing pedometers. I was an early adopter. So um, the year I wore a pedometer and tried to get 10,000 steps, I think it's the year I gained 30 pounds in one year. <laughs> Um, and, but I tried every new device that came on the market. This was an FM radio built into a pedometer. Um, and I even am the anonymous reviewer in Ann Arbor, from Ann Arbor, who um, complained about it on Amazon.com. Um, so I was really you know, an aficionado um, of these devices. So thinking about you know, these devices, one, obviously, you know, people want to know how many steps they walk, but really what they want to know is how many calories are they burning, right? And um, you really need to know not just how many you're burning, but how many you're burning in relation to how many you've taken in. So what is your calorie balance? Well, to really use these devices to help you do that, you also have to track your intake, right? So you, you know, there, there are various ways to measure your intake, and it's really um, uh, a pain, and it's really one of the, the pain points for people struggling with weight management. Um, but in the area of energy expenditure, um, what a lot of these devices do is they take your number of steps, and then they use a formula, and I'm sure you all have used formulas like this, where you put in your age, your height, your weight, your gender, and then you select what is your overall level of activity, and it gives you a number. And um, in my case, during this period of my life where I was really, really, really limiting my intake and exercising like a maniac, you know, the formula says I would, would have been burning about 2,500 calories a day. Well, how many of you have heard of the quantified self-movement? No one? Or you just don't want to stand up? <laughs> no one? Okay. Um, the quantified self-movement is something I'll talk about a little bit more later, but um, let's just say I was one of the original quantified selfers. Um, during this period in my life, I was tracking every calorie I ate, every calorie I burned, um, and you can see for the first six weeks, my weight loss was a grand total of two-tenths of one pound. Um, and but, you know, when I looked at how many calories I ate and how many I burned, I should have been losing um, on the order of about a pound and a half a week. So, you know, kind of clearly something was wrong, um, and um, it was extremely distressing. Well, a year later, you will notice that I um, ran, I, you know, I'm running in races this whole time, and um, I actually uh, came in fifth place in my age group in this race and uh, fifth place in this much larger um, race in my age group. 
um, and my, my per minute time, running time, dropped by like two, over two minutes, and um, uh, it actually, I wound up actually having a tremendous transformation. And there is something very clear that I attribute that transformation to, and that is I had my metabolic rate actually clinically measured, and I learned how many calories I was burning. And I did this several times. I joined a, a clinical weight management program um, at a university in a adjacent state that shall go unnamed. Um, and when I, you know, I they tested my metabolism, I go back several weeks later after no success in weight loss. The doctor comes in the room and she says, um, the first thing she says to me, well, we know you're not lying about how little you eat. And I'm like, what? Um, and it turns out that my resting metabolic rate had dropped 600 calories a day because I was restricting calories. And I think that I'm going to have a side business selling T-shirts that say, optimally evolved for famine, because, you know, that, that's, what's, right, that's what's happening. Where, um, is doing, you know, in my case, my body was doing everything it could to hang on to those calories. But somehow, having the knowledge of exactly what my calorie burn was enabled me to lose the weight, and I did it by eating more rather than less and exercising differently. So all that is the very long backdrop to why I've been so, you know, the minute I started seeing these devices coming out, have been kind of obsessed with them. Now, it really shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that anything that's using that formula to estimate your calorie burn that it's inaccurate. Ten years ago, there was an expert, there was a literature review on the use of, you know, those formulas for estimating people's metabolic rates, and this expert panel said, if you're going to use a resting metabolic rate calculated from a predictive equation for a specific individual, you need to use your clinical judgment whether or not that works. In other words, if you get a person who's coming in and saying she's, you know, not losing weight and should be, um, maybe the problem is that estimated metabolic rate, and they recommend using indirect calorimetry to really know what an individual's um, metabolic rate is. Well, until recently, to get that number, you had to go into a, a chamber or swallow some doubly labeled water um, and then have your urine metabolites checked or get hooked up to a, vent, a, 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 a ventilated hood that's measuring your gases or a cart. And these devices would tell you at that moment in time what is your metabolic rate, right? But as I am here to attest, um, that is not a number that stays constant. For <clears throat> 10 years, there has been a portable device in use, and I used to go to this place in uh, Ann Arbor and pay $25 and blow into a tube for five minutes, and it would tell me my metabolic rate. Um, this is a device called MedGem. You can walk into 121 Fitness right now and pay them 25 or 50 bucks um, and get this test done. Um, it is has been had been validated against the gold standard. It's not perfect. However, I think we need to be asking the question, is it good enough that we can start using devices like this and incorporate them in weight management programs? Now, this raises the question, how many people like me are there out there? Am I typical or am I typical of people who you know, maybe lost weight several times successfully with Weight Watchers, um, but then at some point that stopped working, so you become, res you know, re reactive to calorie restriction. And the answer is we don't really know because until now the only way to know was to have people go into a lab and have their metabolism measured and you'd know what it was for that point in time. So there are some studies out there that show a big range of how much variation there is between groups of people. Um, you know, and studies say it could be as little as 3% or it could be um, as, as much as, as 50%, 60%. Um, oh, sorry, that was the next slide. Um, the variation between people. Um, and there was one study that um, 
looked at 150 <clears throat> people and showed that the range of resting metabolism ranged from 1027 calories to 2499. So, you know, two and a half times um, difference. A lot of the difference is explained by your body mass, um, but not all of it. Um, there was another study that showed among people with the same um, size and lean body weight, the people who burnt the most burnt 28 to 32 percent more than those who burnt the least. And the most extreme was one person, you know, a pair of people who the difference was 715 calories a day. Um, so, you know, that's just a you know, give you some idea. And um, within a person, also, the variation that's of interest, um, one study showed that looking at people a year apart in time, on average, the variation was about 15%, but ranged from 3 to 36. Um, other studies have, have shown differences. I haven't reviewed this literature super comprehensively, um, and if anybody has um, more than me, please point me to other studies. But that's kind of my assumption of, of um, where you know where we are with with uh, variation, and that 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 formula for or the the model for how we think about. Um, the, the relationship between energy expenditure and uh, energy intake and calorie balance is really very, very complicated because all these kind of things, um, in your medical conditions, whether you're hungry, how much sleep you have, are affecting all of these other things, and all of these other things are affecting these other things. So we need to be looking at you know, complex systems modeling to really understand these, but this is part of what I'm trying to do with my sort of invention. Um, I'm now almost finished with my disclosure. So this is my last disclosure, is that I really would like for Case Western Reserve University to be a center for taking advantage of these wireless um, devices. Now, before uh, a month ago when they put up a poster in the BRB, how many of you knew that Case Western has a program in San Diego for wireless health? Anyone stand up in for San that Diego? one? In San Diego, thank you. Um, at, at any rate, this is a new uh, master's degree program and uh, it's working closely with Qualcomm that's based in San Diego. Um, and this program is run out of the School of Engineering, and I really would like to bring to bear, you know, the kind of expertise we have in nursing, in the Prevention Research Center, medicine, and engineering, and really have our institution become a hub um, for this. And I see uh, in the back of the room one of my colleagues from the VA uh, Advanced Platform Technology Center um, that also is, is working in this area, and that could be good uh, collaborative opportunities. So, all the disclosures out of the way, back to the roadmap of the talk. Now we're going to start going through the devices. Um, so, back to the lowly pedometer that's been in use for a, a long time. How effective are they in getting people to lose weight um, or you know, achieve whatever objectives you're looking for? Well, we know from meta-analysis that they're somewhat effective in increasing the number of steps you take and uh, overall uh, physical activity, and they can have a slight uh, impact on your body mass index and um, other parameters. And we know that what's most effective in using these devices is if a person sets a goal for themselves of taking a certain number of steps and um, not being in a work setting uh, actually um, is more effective than if you get the device in conjunction with being uh, at a work setting. Um, now, how accurate are these pedometers in, S, you know, a lot of them will pop up your number of steps and your number of calories. How accurate are they in estimating calories, as you can guess, not vary, um, and the accuracy varies by speed, and they don't take into account the intensity of the movement, um, and uh, they're, they're, they're very oversimplified. They also don't account for how many calories you would have been burning anyway during the hour that you went walking. So it might tell you, you know, you're burning 320 calories an hour while you're walking, but guess what? You would have burned 200 something anyway. So you don't really get to eat the bagel afterwards. You, you know, can eat half of an apple maybe. 
Um, so we then, you know, over the last five, eight years, um, have started moving into devices that have accelerometers in them as opposed to the pedometers that have a more mechanical uh, uh, function. And these devices give you steps, distance. They may tell you other things about movement and, again, this calorie estimation. But then we've taken a quantum leap um, in the last few years with these devices like the Jawbone and the Fitbit that also um, they may track sleep and they may allow personalization. So it may be that you can put in certain parameters and it's going to adjust um, what it tells you. They may be interactive. You may be able to you know, say what goals you want to set or what have you. And if you put in your nutrition intake, they might give you a more accurate estimate of, of um, calorie balance. And they can, you know, instead of just looking at how many calories did I burn over a whole day, um, you can see how many calories did I burn during this specific period of time. And that's really the part that, you know, I, where I think the, the money is and what I'm really personally <coughs> working on. These... Um, these uh, apps and devices tend to have smartphone apps and displays that will show you, you know, various parameters. Um, people always find the sleep uh, especially interesting, and it's showing light, and, you know, heavy and light sleep. And again, the this the extent to which these devices are validated really, really varies. A lot of them are developed by fit, you know, people whose focus is on fitness. And by and large, there has not been a lot of kind of academic input um, into the, the development of these devices, which is part of why I think they're not being used um, in population research the way that I think that they could be. Um, some of the devices focus on goal setting and gamification. So in other words, make a game out of um, doing something. This, was, this is my own um, basis B1 watch. Um, that uh, I set a goal of not sitting for more than an hour at a time during the day. And if I meet my goal of doing that three or four days a week, what is my prize? What is my reward that I get to unlock and set another goal? <laughs> so, you know, how effective are these things? Well, I've seen, I've got a whole slew of um, slides of articles talking about people abandoning their devices because you know, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you do with this? This isn't really helping me. Um, one, there's only one place that I've seen something like this that I think is a very, very useful function in kind of the future, and that is benchmarking and showing, well, how do my numbers compare with other people? And so this is a case of sleep um, compared to other men under 25 years who are normal or underweight. This person is in the 32nd percentile of sleep. Um, where does that one come from, then? Um, I do not remember which device this is, to be honest. I could probably figure it out. But um, this, and, and, and some of the devices are trying to move toward kind of interpretation. And I'll tell you why I put interpretation in quotes. So this is showing you from my uh, basis watch the number of calories burned per hour every hour of the day. So, you know, the darker the color, the more calories per hour. Well, I might look at this and say, well, gee, you know, between midnight and 6 a.m., I'm not generally, well, or between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., um, I'm not burning very many calories, so maybe what I need to do is just stay up and, you know, be active all the time. And, and of course, we know that that would be the worst thing yeah. you can do because we're hearing a lot about um, sleep being very important for um, metabolism. Um, another thing that some devices enable you to do is to download your data. And um, there's a lot going on with that, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a bit. So, you know, to kind of get an assessment of where we are with these um, pedometer versus accelerometer um, devices, the accelerometer devices um, are allow some user input of information. They can be somewhat personalized. But fundamentally, any device that is hanging loose on your wrist or clipped to your shoe or clipped to your waistband is still using that formula. It's still taking the amount of movement that you took 
and sticking it into the formula. And so if two people who were the same age, size, gender, height and weight, and walked around like co-joined twins all day, their devices would tell them they burn the same number of calories. And you know that that's not true. Um, so, you know, I'd say use, you know, take the data you get out of them with a grain of salt. And, you know, this is a, this, a illustration of two guys who are similar size and one of them winds up really happy and one of them <laughs> disappointed because uh, his results didn't match up with what he was expecting. So, we are, as it turns out, on the verge of, you know, really just the very beginning of a huge um, adoption of these, the more smarter devices. Um, this, this company that analyzes smartphone, smart device, wearable device sales says that 2014 is going to be the massive opportunity in the medical and wearable segments these devices are going to become the key consumer technology in 2014. Now, part of what's propelling this, or part of what is being propelled by the availability of the devices, is something called the quantified self movement. And I showed you how um, 10 years ago, maybe I was the first quantified selfer in the, in the universe. I doubt it. but. Um, Anyway, you saw my, my quantification, and I was literally, you know, looking at three-week moving averages and running regressions and was <laughs> not able to figure out why I can lose weight. Um, so if, if you go to this uh, quantified self, they have a guide of uh, a couple hundred um, applications that just help people quantify their personal information. A lot of them are focused on business functions, like how many emails do I send, and, and that sort of thing. Um, there's a study I read that sort of analyzes what, what do people want to get out of tracking, and some people just want to document what they're doing. Other people are using it to be sort of goal, um, you know, help them reach a goal. People, other people use it for diagnosis. I want to figure out, you know, what are the days that I uh, have terrible stomach pains? What am I eating that's causing that? Some people do it to collect rewards. Um, and then there are others who do it to have, you know, you can, uh, there are social networks um, that, that, that um, come up in forums around the, the self-tracking. Um, so this is just an example of one called DATUM, D-A-Y-T-U-M. Um, that basically produces infographics out of your own personal data. Um, I have started using something called Saga, and it tells um, you know how much time I spend doing various things, various places, and there are all sorts of you know little um, pictures that that you can see out of it. Um, now um, back to the interactive part. Um, this will be a little quiz, and that is, um, and forgive the crass language, this really is a game out there, I didn't make it up. Um, uh, but I want you to stand up if you think the following things as I pop them up are real. If, if you think they're real, stand up. That there's an app called Moody's that you speak into your smartphone and it will give you an emotional analysis. Do you think that's real? Oh, yeah. If it's not, it should, it should be. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, the next one, finger mill. Let your fingers do the walking on a smartphone treadmill. Oh, my goodness. Only three, oh, four, okay. Um, and three, spreadsheets that is ranking states according to the duration of second acts in the state. Okay, um, so the answer is uh, Moody's is for real. It is an app that you it analyzes various things about your speech. Um, the finger mill was called the worst app ever invented, um, but the person who invented it subsequently went on to invent something called Sumly that summarizes news, and he sold it to Yahoo for 18 million pounds. Um, so that's a lot of money. Um, and spreadsheets, <laughs> if you read the New York Times last week, uh, is real. And um, it tells us uh, it, it uses the accelerometer and the, I guess that means you must wear it, 
um, and the microphone in your smartphone to track your duration, thrust, and decibel peak. Ohio um, doesn't look so good. And um, <laughs> um, the, the, range, <laughs> the range of results, um, they don't call New Mexico the land of enchantment for nothing. It's seven minutes. Couples there last five times longer than our northernmost neighbors in Alaska who complete the deed in just one minute and 20 months. <laughs> so it's related to cold. It's related to cold. Um, Is there a satisfaction? Um, you know, I'm sure there's a you know the spouse can go and do a life. Um, Is that an opt-in thing, or do your does every phone just do that? Oh no, you have to download that as a don't worry. Give me your phone out. Okay, so, um, you know, sort of moving on to, like, where are we with wearable sensors? What can they do now or in the near future? There's a lot of work going on with sensors measuring dehydration, um, glucose. I think the killer app is going to be the one that will be able to sense what you've eaten without you having yeah. to track it. Yeah. Um, and there, um, actually, I'll mention a couple ways that that is being collected. Um, ECGs, alcohol concentration, blow into your smartphone, um, et cetera. Now, how these devices are doing it, there's a big movement in wearable clothing, and there's even a company in Cleveland that's setting up shop um, that's got intelligent clothing. Google Glass, obviously, um, uh, is looking at all sorts of, of health applications. Um, plugging things into your smartphone so that you could do an EKG or thermometer or what have you. Um, something called a smart fork that you can stick in your food to eat it, and then it knows, it supposedly um, knows what it is that you're eating. And I heard the other day, I didn't track it down, about some sensors that you actually put on your jaw, um, and be, by the cadence of your chewing, um, it's supposed to estimate what you've eaten. Now, um, one thing just for people to be aware of if you're getting into this space is um, where does FDA enforcement come in? You know, if you've got a smartphone that's, that's doing it, you know, measuring your glucose, um, does it have to do it right? Um, and the answer is that last September, the FDA came out with guidance saying, we are only going to apply our regulatory oversight to mobile apps and devices where the functionality could pose a risk to patient safety if the app did not function it as intended. So they make it very clear that anything that is a device or that is you know, a smartphone interacting with a physical device that would be regulated is regulated. However, there's a whole set of things that fall into enforcement discretion, which was the FDA's way of saying, we are not going to go after you. You know, you may develop these devices and say whatever you like about them. If you're using them for sort of coaching and prompting in relation to, say, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, if you're promoting strategies for maintaining a healthy weight, getting optimal nutrition and exercise, all of those the FDA you know, doesn't, uh, isn't concerned with. Um, in the past uh, week or two or three, there's been a huge amount of uh, attention and anticipation about two, device, two, two things coming out. Um, one is Samsung's smart SIM band. Um, and uh, as you can see from this prototype, it's supposed to be able to give you, you know, real-time monitoring of a bunch of uh, biometric uh, parameters. And um, uh, even more uh, interest and attention is Apple um, that is looking at having the smartphone interact with your electronic health record and integrate data from all of these um, other types of, of apps. Um, now, this is the part where, remember back to that slide about Case and the wireless health program in San Diego? So Apple, for two years, has had a not very public partnership with the Mayo Clinic on 
uh, would be uh, one time colleague James Levine, who's one of the, the most uh, innovative people out there that uh, we had tried to bring to case. Um, there is a partnership between Apple, Mayo Clinic, Epic, which is the electronic health record that something like 50% of the population is now covered on, um, and they are designing open APIs so that anybody can connect their apps with their, you know, sort of platform. So, um, you know, this, want, this is going to drive people to the Mayo Clinic, right? If you've got, say, you're tracking diabetes and it's going to be all integrated with, well, here's what Mayo Clinic can do for you um, in diabetes. Um, the other one that I'm very uh, envious of is UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, has a big um, partnership with Samsung around this device, and they, they want to really accelerate the development of um, these sensor devices. They have lab space set up where um, you can bring in people to you know, do all sorts of real-time testing, and you've got those gold standard laboratory pieces of equipment right there. So um, I think that these are really huge, bringing the academic institutions together with the device and, and sensor developers because I think that partnership hasn't been there before. Um, so I just you know put put that out there in hopes that we can bring you know the really substantial powerhouse we have at Case, especially with the engineering uh, school and nursing and, and medicine. Um, dental that, that we really you know try to try to get on the map. Now, right now today, there are two devices on the market that actually have sensors built into them for measuring metabolism. One is this Basis B1 watch, um, and the other is this body media um, armband that has um, sensors built right into it that are looking at your skin temperature, your Heat, how fast heat is evaporating from your body, and the electrical activity that's a, a, also a measure of your, your um, activity, and, then, and the accelerometers, of course, and then they use that to give you a very personalized measure of how many calories you are burning. So back to my transparency, um, it is the body media device that I have been trying to build an app with, um, and I've actually been to their uh, corporate headquarters, and they're kind of interested. So I'm, you know, hoping that that we may get somewhere. Now, the, the thing to know about these devices is you have they have to be worn on your body, um, but it really is my belief that they offer transformational potential for weight management clinically, but also um, research and population level interventions. It's been very interesting to me that most consumers and even the technology reviewers don't seem to differentiate between mm -hmm. devices that are hanging loose on your wrist and devices that are actually measuring your personal body functions. So um, you heard it, you heard it here. Um, one of the objections of the academic community is that these devices have proprietary methods of coming up with that calorie estimation. Um, this just shows you from the basis watch the kind of things then that you can see um, of your own you know, body parameter, your heart rate, your steps, your calories, your skin temperature, etc. cetera. Um, but this is what you see from the body media um, device, and this is showing you the number of calories. This is the number of calories on the y-axis going up from uh, zero to eight here, and um, the number of calories burned every single minute of the day and night. And as you can see, um, while I'm sleeping, it's uh, about one calorie a minute, um, and I can literally look at my my reading and know what I did that day. The, the three flights of steps that I walk up mm -hmm. um, to get to my office every day has a very characteristic look, and I can look at my data and see um, when that happened. And I think people tend to be really surprised when they see this to see how incredibly episodic the behavior, the, your calorie burn is. I think most people would assume, you know, maybe over the course of the day, you know, it starts out slow while I'm asleep and then I get moving, you know, and it kind of goes like that. But in fact, at least for me, um, the minute I sit down, 
my calorie, my <coughs> metabolic rate goes down to that um, resting level. This um, is my husband's, um, and uh, you know you can see just how incredibly different uh, the pattern is, and he's not hyperactive. So, um, you know, I don't know if his metabolism just stays more elevated than mine or what have you, but um, anyway, uh, you know, I think it's, it's of interest. Just to show you how incredibly sensitive these devices are, this is one, and this is a close-up of um, a, a couple hour period of time during the night, and um, with the two different devices, the, the body media and the basis, and you can see in both of them, I, I don't know if I rolled over or I you know, got a drink of water, so, you know, just something um, while I was sleeping, um, and both of the devices just picked that up you know, with, with, with perfect correlation. How long did that last? When? How long did... <laughs> um, it lasted a lot longer in New Mexico. Oh, 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 no, that's, that, that was just, uh, that was a little too short, a little too short for that. A little too short. Um, that was not my husband wearing one device and me wearing, device, me, wearing both of, me wearing both of the devices. Um, this is um, sleep, and these devices can supposedly, you know, show you when you're in REM and light and deep sleep. Um, and uh, how, the extent to which that's validated, I don't know. I better speed up or I'm not going to get through everything. Um, anyway, just to show you, uh, um, it is my belief that the body media device is dramatically superior to the basis, um, just from, from my own experience, but the body media device was invented at the University of Pittsburgh in about 2002. It has hundreds of published validation and outcome studies um, looking at it, and just recently there was a um, study comparing the more current devices that are out there, um, and it found that body media was the most accurate in predicting energy expenditure compared to a gold standard, and the basis was actually worse than the um, ones that are don't have sensors in it. Um, so you know that's just just out there. Um, they have been shown to be effective in helping people with weight management. So just for example, with the body media device, um, in a group weight loss program, people who you know just did the usual care, didn't lose any weight, people who just went to the group lost a little, people who just used an armband did better than people who just were in a group, but people who had an armband plus a group weight loss had dramatically um, uh, better results, and that's a typical finding that's been shown many times. Um, so now I want to zoom through sort of where this is all going, current and future uses. Um, the really important thing is that these apps, some of the device makers make it very easy to connect different apps. So for example, with the Body Media one, um, I connect with an app, um, my fitness pal, that I actually use for inputting my nutrition because it's easier to do it that way. Um, and uh, uh, there are apps, things that will let you share your data with your, uh, your healthcare provider or um, an app that analyzes your sleep you know, more thoroughly than what uh, the device manufacturer does. Now, I think there are some opportunities that haven't been captured. Um, for example, smoking cessation. There are apps out there for smoking cessation. One reason that people don't want to quit smoking is they're afraid of weight gain. And so I could envision if you were wearing a device like this that's measuring your metabolism, you could look in real time and say, well, gee, you know, am I seeing metabolic changes while I'm quitting smoking? And be able to make a, you know, quick adjustments um, to your lifestyle to accommodate that. Uh, pregnancy, women are gaining more, in general, are gaining too much weight. Um, and there are all sorts of apps, but they all are estimating based on formulas. Well, why not use a device like this to see how many more calories a woman really is burning every, you know, each week of pregnancy and then estimate your nutrition needs from that. Um, how many people got, have gotten genetic test results from 23andMe? Stand up, no. Um, uh, 23andMe was shut down by the FDA, but before they did, they gave results to a million people about their certain genetic tests, 
and they have told people various things that relate to fitness and uh, uh, weight management. This is a colleague of mine's results, and she's a really lucky one who's told that if she exercises, her uh, BMI will go down. If she decreases her calories and increases her physical activity through walking, she will lose weight. Lucky. Um, but whether or not these are, you know, have any validity to them, I don't know. But with the million people out there with those results, I sure would love to invite them to give me their data and wear these devices, and then, you know, let's look empirically. Um, who knows what that image is? Anybody? Dustin, Dustin, Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman, the graduate. And what is Mr. Robinson telling Dustin Hoffman? That your future is in plastics. plastics. <laughs> well, if I were to remake The Graduate today, what I would tell you is um, <laughs> your future is the microbiome. Um, last year, the Cleveland Clinic looked at um, fecal transplant as the number six yeah. innovation of the year. And um, there's a lot of research showing that if you just transplant the microbiome, also known as sort of feces, uh, you know, the, the, bi the biologic intestinal activity. Intestinal flora is a nice way to Thank you. <laughs> uh, flora, intestinal flora, thank you. Um, from a fat mouse into a thin mouse, the thin mouse will get fat. Similarly, after having bariatric surgery, the microbiome changes immediately, and when those microbiome from a mouse that had bariatric surgery were transplanted into a mouse that didn't have bariatric surgery, the other mouse lost weight. Um, and so, you know, I think this is really, really the future, and so you can think about the intersection of having these devices that measure metabolism, that that could be a great opportunity. Well, in fact, there is a company right now that is inviting you to pay them $89 and give them samples, give you sample, give you give them samples, um, and they will analyze your um, microbiome. There is another company that's analyzing just the movement patterns of people who are wearing these devices, and they claim um, that they can classify people according to whether they have uh, Parkinson's disease, obesity, depression, migraine headaches, uh, uh, anxiety disorder, osteoarthritis, and even type 1 diabetes just based on the movement patterns that these devices are measuring. Um, other ways we could think about using them with children, worksite wellness programs, um, di different clinical conditions that affect or are affected by um, metabolism and population health. And I'm going to talk about, you know, a couple of those for a minute. Um, one is that this is, just, I don't know if you can see that, but um, this is the sleep pattern of somebody with Parkinson's disease. And you can see at night um, it's picking up, you know, the, the movements from the disease just to let you know it's that sensitive. Um, community health applications right now um, there's a website you can go to, and you can see where our um, bike, where people are biking, and where people are walking, just on data collected from people's smartphones. So this is like zooming in on uh, Northeast Ohio. Um, these are the bike and the running uh, activity areas. Um, there's a community that in Kentucky is looking at giving people these uh, sensors and aggregating all the data to you know, understand community <laughs> health. Um, Arizona State University, where James Levine, our colleague who went to, uh, who's at the Mayo Clinic, set up a partnership with Arizona State University, and they are doing all sorts of things to try to make it an optimal wellness uh, environment. Uh, New York University is equipping this area with sensors in the environment and inviting people who work in the area to contribute their data um, so that they understand the health um, of their population. Um, I have been collaborating, I've been sort of recruiting uh, faculty from across the university who are interested uh, in this, and a number of them worked with me quite a bit and uh, are help, trying to help me commercialize uh, my invention, so they are all uh, named here, uh, including uh, the daughter of uh, one of our visitors here today is uh, Andrew Marks, my summer uh, intern. Um, and so with that, I will stop and uh, answer any questions. So just a 
stand up. You're supposed to stand up. It was 600 calories difference. Okay. So, in other words, so it was 1900 instead of 25. Um, no, it was actually like 1100. Yeah, I mean that 2500 includes Your the wife. activity, okay. right? But so you subtract out the activity, and um, at the beginning it was like 1800, 1900 is my resting, and it dropped to 11, 1200. Okay. Um, because I was running six, you know, that's the equivalent of running six miles a day just to have the privilege of eating 1,200 calories a day and not losing weight. Now, when you um, found that out, did you only eat 1,100 or did you eat more? I needed to eat, I had been eating, you know, 1,200 calories a day, and I found out that I needed to be between 1,250 and 1,350 calories a day, never go below that. Okay. Um, and now I'm doing a lot of even different things um, and trying to see what the effect is on my metabolic rate. Okay. And I know you had pulled up um, your like graph and your husband's graph. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know, but because um, you had mentioned that his is a little higher, that men do have higher metabolic rates. Um, yes, they, 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 <laughs> certainly, they, they certainly do. Um, but I, I was just interested in trying to see if I can, uh, um, no, I'm going to actually open mine on the screen if it'll open up. Um, so if it'll open, and I can also show you in real time. Anyway, um, yes, men do have generally faster metabolic rates. But if it's apples to apples, like a 140 pound man, 140 pound female with the same you know what I mean? The same yeah, the men still have BMIs and everything. Um, you know, I don't. That, that's I, something that. Yeah. The minute I saw that, it was like because I've been thinking about that a lot based on. Mm -hmm. Is it just that <laughs> muscle mass has yeah. a lot to do with it? Yeah. But if you had the same BMI, you know, muscle mass. Well, if you had the same muscle mass, then I would have the same. You probably have the same, right? Yeah. So I don't know if it's male or female versus. But just men tend to have a higher yeah. muscle mass yeah. naturally. Just females, naturally. Yeah. Yeah. We have to work harder. Right. It can affect <laughs> your resting. Yeah, bigger brains, too. It's just not fair. Yeah. Oh, oh, I know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> cubic centimeters, bigger brains. Oh. And, and actually, the like brain uses that. glucose. 25% of glucose is consumed by the brain. So they're going to eat more, and it's consumed by the brain. So it's not so, you know, Mary, Mary Holmes was here, and she said, well, as long as people think of food as fuel, or calorie in, calorie out, is it's just a very limited view. I, um, I, I want to mention that a professor emeritus from some Georgia University came and gave a talk in physiology, <clears throat> and he sp spent like uh, a couple minutes talking about stem cell differentiation and that vibration causes, and I even looked into the literature, but vibrational energy causes uh, stem cell growth and differentiation into skeletal muscle rather than fat cells. Um, and, and that he gave, the rest of his talk was all about childhood obesity, the, the idea of calories in, calories out is not an adequate view. Um, and uh, and so I think that we have to look at this as a, you know as the whole person and all the activity and what they're eating because you can alter vitamin D and then you're altering the whole physiology. So the you know that that quantified self movement has all these tools that enable you to do kind of self experimentation um, so that you can kind of test um, what sort of things are making a difference. Yeah. Well, and, and not to mention the, the whole Atkins concept of, you know, like what you eat, more protein versus carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so Amy, maybe when you were running, you were wearing shoes that cushioned your heel too much. You didn't get enough impact and vibration that influenced huh. your physiology. Uh, that's an interesting, interesting yeah. theory. We're supposed yeah. to be barefoot. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're designed, and it wasn't yeah. that long ago that we didn't have rubber heels. Yeah. Right. 
Um, yeah. They were leveled. I, I do think this point of like the law of thermodynamics guiding how we think about obesity. So calories in equals calories out, right? And if it balances, then we're going to maintain. If it doesn't, we have a problem. And it recently I have read in much more cutting edge worlds and not necessarily academic literature um, from a variety of fields, like this issue of gut biome, um, surface area exposure within the intestinal wall, you know, how dictates in part how much calorie is absorbed within the body, so if you have more surface area exposure versus less. And, and I find that to be really interesting, and then my public health side of me is like, so what do we do with that? Like, that just feels like it goes to a very individual level response. And so I'd, I'd like your thought on, you know, what, where do we go next from a public health perspective with this kind of information? Well, I mean, I, I think that you, you sort of balance that individual focus with the population focus and look at the research on things like um, the transmission of obesity across generations because if women are under stress while they're pregnant, um, you know, the offspring will be susceptible to obesity, everything else kept constant. Or the way that we respond to cues in the environment. I have a slide that I didn't, um, that I didn't show, but um, uh, I sometimes put this up at the beginning of the talk and then, oh, sorry, that's a... Uh, there. I sometimes put this slide of a brownie up at the beginning of a talk, and then at the end of the talk, I put it back up and I ask how many people noticed the slide of the brownie, and then how many people thought about it a few times during my talk, how many people couldn't think about, couldn't hear my talk because all they were doing was thinking about the brownie, or how many people were on their cell phone looking for the route to Starbucks so that they can stop and get a brownie the minute they get out of here. So, you know, and I know which group I'm in. Um, and I think we um, it respond, you know, our brains literally respond differently to environmental cues and the targeted marketing of, of you know, sugar drinks and, and unhealthy food in low-income and uh, Hispanic communities in particular, um, you know, is something that, that we need to be looking at and exposing. Yeah? How soon do you think this these devices would be affordable for people in those um, low SES or even for a mass public health kind of intervention? Like when? When would that be something that would be possible to do? So right now, the, the sensor-based devices are about 100 to 120, 140 dollars. Um, I would like us to see making them available through employee health programs, like have that be an incentive or something, um, in exchange for sharing some of your de-identified aggregated data. Um, or commercial weight management programs to kind of build, you know, just build it into the cost. Um, but we should also be able to come up with very inexpensive devices, you know, not too long from now. But who has the incentive to do that? Well, maybe a university or, a, you know, nonprofits um, to, to fund the creation of low cost sensors that could be available to everyone. Um, I think we're all oriented towards data and like data and not everybody has a similar uh, like of numbers and data and, and have you've talked about a couple of applications that were community based and have, have there been um, efforts to uh, change the kind of information to be appealing to everybody who may not like you know, individual data or data tracking kinds of things, or, or do those images so seem to resonate? So you're talking about sort of developing an interface that is directed, that is designed to be friendly to low education or income or or, or just people who are numerical literacy populations. Correct. 
Um, it's, it's a great thought. There's nobody that I know that's doing that, but that's exactly why I want to engage groups like you to be thinking about creation of um, uh, methods, ways to translate this technology to, to different populations. Because the manufacturers don't care about it. Yeah? Uh, is this similar to marketing um, exercise equipment? Where lots of people will, oh, I'll well, get this, and then they don't use it, or it's ineffective. That, that is indeed what I'm finding, you know, and it's, it's anecdotal, but a very high proportion of people abandon their devices. I mean, how many have you guys tried at the, at the Prevention Research Center? I know you started with the move bands and, you know, with people wear, trying to wear um, devices, and they're abandoning them because it's not giving useful, personalized feedback, and so that's really what I'm trying to do with my invention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I just wondering, between the body media and the um, basis C1, do you feel like this gives you uh, better things to look at, better detail? I, I mean, I like some of the features of the basis interface um, that um, you know, you can you can customize what shows up on the display, um, right? Okay. Um, but this one doesn't let you download your data, and they don't have any APIs, so you can't connect it with anything. Um, they were just bought by Intel, um, so it's not quite known what's going to happen. Um, on the other hand, Body Media was bought by Jawbone. Uh, for $100 million about a year and a half ago. Um, and it's also not quite known uh, what's going to happen with them. But I do, I really um, like this device, um, the interface a good deal, and you can um, ag you know, look at data in different levels of aggregation and what have you. All right. Well, I think we should thank our speaker and um, give us lots of stuff to talk. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Again, if you didn't sign in, um, please do that. There are sheets out there on the, on the front. And thanks for attending.